I'm Victor Acevedo. I'm here with Patrick Lichty to share ideas about our work in the show, Techpressionism, Digital and Beyond, and a bit about our working processes and the concepts behind them. Techpressionism, Digital and Beyond is an international exhibition of artists using technology as a means of expression. It opened on April 23rd, 2022 at the Southampton Arts Center in Southampton, New York. It was curated by Colin Goldberg. The exhibition advisor is Helen Harrison, director of the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center. That is Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner. The show will be up through July 23rd, 2022. I believe the exhibition is quite stunning in its presentation. And it's well worth the trip to see it in person at the Southampton Arts Center which is located less than 60 miles from New York City. You can also see the work online and um, I will share my screen and just show you what the uh, website looks like here a little bit. Yeah, so it's here at techpressionism.com and uh, there's a, a 3D walkthrough that is very compelling. You can see the whole show remotely that way. Uh, here's the formal techpressionism definition. It's an artistic approach in which technology is utilized as a means to express emotional experience. It's also a 21st century artistic and social movement. So I invite you to uh, come back and circle back around and check this out. It uh, has a lot of material. Here's the list of artists. I believe there's- Oh, over look at that. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty impressive, quite, quite a survey of mm -hmm. uh, artists. There's a lot of media coverage. There's the video and radio spots, publications, periodicals. There's been some pre-recorded uh, conversations and tours of the show that you can now find on YouTube. Uh, there on the right is the uh, picture of the front facade of the building. And uh, there's Helen Harrison. Here's a program coming up with uh, Shimon Ati. We'll be talking about the show and the concept of expressionism. And there's a couple of programs that have uh, been recorded, uh, conversations, East End mm -hmm. Tech, Femtech, and here's the map. And uh, we had a, a recording uh, interview with Ann Spalter and also the curator, Colin Goldberg. So here's mm -hmm. the, there's a video component and here's a list of those works. Patrick, would you like to begin uh, sharing your screen and talk about your work in the show? Sure, sure, sure. Let's let's go in and uh, let's go in and do that. Let's see here. I'll just go to my desktop. So what I have here is what I'm calling text expressions and beginning to Southampton, and uh, basically this has two parts, and one is just going to be where I talk about my work in the uh, Southampton show for text expressions and text expressionism, digital and beyond, called, uh, carried by Colin Goldberg. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my work, um, which is uh, text expressionist still life number three. Uh, this was, um, I had this in the show because of its historical significance and that it was, um, uh, it was the, um, it was the boilerplate image for the Text Expressionism International um, Open in 2021, um, which was uh, Text Expressionism and Text Expressionism's first large um, whole community-wide show with over 95 artists in it uh, from all over the world. And um, so I was thrilled to have this piece in there. And uh, as we'll sit, talk about in, in the second um, area, this comes from my roots in Kandinsky from 1993, um, going forward through all sorts of different permutations. And, um, and there was also another uh, piece in the show, uh, a piece called um, The Martin, which I did for uh, my wife and um, a fellow tech expressionist, Nagina Tasabian. Um, who founded the uh, um, textpressionism.ir uh, node. And um, this is a piece that's done using the um, uh, VQ, VQ clip um, GAN with a night cafe. And I'll just show this with flying. One from a distant land. So I won't be talking about this so much, it but I wanted to talk about this. Um, so... Uh, the situation with this is that um, in 
let's see here, tech expressionism as such started in, uh, I think, what, August 2020, um, August 2020. And um, Colin Goldberg and I went to grad school together at Bowling Green State. So I've known, um, I graduated in 2006. So I've known him for about 17, 18 years. And, um, and this, this is why I'm one of the founders. And he said, Patrick, I'm going to start this thing. You know what I'm, I'm thinking about and let you, know, you want to do this. And I said, um, sure, sign me on. Let's, let's, um, let's do this. And then um, Nagin signed on and we're, you know, we've been doing this ever since almost the beginning. And so um, for the collaborative shows, which there have only been two so far, um, Colin said, you want to work on, on the second one? And I said, absolutely. And so what, what happened is that Colin has this, um, in his Metagraph pieces, he has this uh, kind of wireframe uh, sort of approach. And I have this uh, calligraphic and also this uh, kind of uh, painterly approach uh, from my own calligraphy works. And then where I, how I'm mix, mixing those with machine learning or GAN pieces uh, and mixing those together. So Colin and I got together. Let's call it collaboration two. And um, it's this is actually really funny is because of the fact that Colin does kind of like um, what they call a semic or lacking meaning, you know, uh, calligraphy works. And um, so we, we kind of ping pong back and forth in these mm. pieces which is really interesting. Cool. Um, so what I kind of do here is I kind of take in, um, in uh, play form, they have this uh, thing called sketch and I'll take a style, basically say Baroque or romantic, et cetera. And this is a, this is a sketch that I did, you know, on my iPad. And then I'd start do I start assigning the style transfer to it. And layer about five or six or seven of these different ones, you know, and really playing with the color and such. And this is also another one of my calligraphies basically thrown through a, um, a GAN as well. And um, one thing that's one step forward from the piece in the show, this is, this is the only NFT of, the, uh, uh, of this that came out. But <laughs> taking these processes and, and actually turn them into animations. Hmm. So cool. what the, yep. Very nice. So what the, so what the idea behind this is that um, what I've been interested in, in regards to text expressionism is the idea of a, um, the idea of what Kandinsky wrote about the um, expression of the inner life uh, the, the subject with on, on the, you know, on, on the plane. And, um, and then on the other hand, how one can work with the, uh, what Casey Reeves calls the apparatus of the machine learning system to maybe tease kind of a, a, a machine subjectivity out and how the, how the, um, well, if there is such a thing, which I don't really think there is, but the, uh, how the, um, how the human being interacts with the um, their own sort of sense of generativity. Say, like for example, um, uh, Arp's idea of automatism, which a lot of this calligraphy is based around. In other words, automatic writing and such. You know, Breton and Arp, and then um, and then basically looking at the GAN as a form of automatism and then creating these works as a sort of um, uh, sort of conversation between the human and the machine since you know uh, human beings made these machines you know our displays have red green and blue LEDs which are you know tuned to our uh, tuned to our cones and our eyes you know these are human machines so in other words you know these machines are um, and their outputs are really just sort of dim mirrors of our own subjectivity. So in regards to tech expressionism, um, I'm really sort of exploring the idea of using the machine as a, as a 
a dim mirror of human subjectivity and, and uh, emotional response and uh, just seeing, seeing what I see, I think. And mm. that's, and I, there's, uh, this is number 14. There's 24 of these and actually they're available on first dibs. <laughs> so anyway, that's, I'm being playful, but um, yeah, that's cool. That's, 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 yeah. And the way that it existed in the show uh, was as a physical print. Did you, yeah. the previous one, you actually printed it out as, th as an inkjet or. It was a, it, it's a, it's a metal print. It's a metal print on um, um, it's a metal print behind uh, acrylic. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. When you say metal print, you mean like the ink is metallic? No, they the uh, material, they, the substrate. It's UV print. It's UV printed on aluminum. Oh, I, okay. was that, I hope I was hoping that was dye bond, but I took a look at it and I, I actually ordered a metal print, kind of like how how Tommy Mintz does. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. So nice. So yeah, that's I'm actually looking forward to getting it back sometime. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very nice way of presenting uh, digital imagery, you know, in a physical form. I think uh, those prints on metal or aluminum. Yeah, and I, I also, I also think like dye bond on, um, on acrylic, you know, gives a certain depth, you know, to, uh, to a piece. Yeah, that's mm. cool. And I like that uh, ro rotating calligraphic. Uh, element in the previous piece that was really cool it's going into the 3d uh, and I'd uh, like to do more with that but uh that's the that's the only that that is the only piece that has gone in that direction hmm. yeah that's nice fantastic thank you so i'm actually the piece i have in the show to expressionism digital and beyond is actually a video it's on the video reel and my piece is called red shadow and this is a uh, of uh, the page in the uh, on the website, which is kind of like a catalog of works, initial catalog. And uh, I'll read this little blurb. This is sort of a, a still image, the th a thumbnail, if you will, of, of the video. It's, it's about uh, uh, a little over a minute long and I'll play it in a moment actually. Uh, but I wrote this blurb, Red Shadow is a micro surrealist narrative. It is a hybrid of animation and video captured at different times and locations. I create imagery with technology, primarily digital art tools, which combine an expressive subjectivity with the inexorable neutrality of geometrical structure. I believe this fits nicely into the definition of expressionism. So let me play the piece. And uh, there is a reel that you can find uh, on the website, but I'm gonna play it off my uh, YouTube channel. Uh, just easier to get, get to. One minute, 40 seconds. That's super. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, one thing I have a question is that, do you remember, um, you've been around for a little bit like me. Uh, do you remember when San Francisco was a KQED, used to um, 
have a show called Live from Off Center. That I, was, I remember that name, and I may have caught yeah. just in passing some of those episodes. Yeah, because it was a it was a it was a video art program. Oh yeah, and so you know, I had a lot of a lot of early digital, a lot of a lot of early computer animation programs. You know, I, I mean, I'm not computer animation art and that sort of thing. So the thing is, is what I wonder is, you know, how you might relate between, um, you know, the genres of video art, uh, where video art intersected with uh, early computer animation, and then how things like VJing, you know, fit today, you know, as real time, real time imaging, because you seem to have elements of all three in there. So that's that's my question. I'm I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead to the Q and A a tiny bit. Oh no, that's fine. Oh yeah, that's okay because we can. Yeah be loose about it. Well, it's good. It's very astute of you to, to, in a sense, to see those, perceive those threads, because in fact, uh, you know, the, the real time VJ component is in there. Yep. Some of the juxtapositions between the live action video and the computer animation were selected from, you know, a live mix performances. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the things I, I dabbled in that into that like in the uh, the teens like 2012 to 2016 pretty heavily uh, doing live gigs uh, for electronic music uh, events just in a small club format mm -hmm. and I found that you know if I recorded those I could bring them back to the studio and insert them into studio works mm -hmm. or I can just in the studio do a live mix and generate imagery that way and you, you can tweak the the pre-rendered you know computer graphics with these digital you know filters that will process the imagery further distort it or you know colorize it in other ways yeah so that's a really interesting process you're going out and you're doing these you're, you're doing these live sets and you're coming back and you're you're mixing you're remixing them with rendered work yes and, you know, so that's kind of interesting. You're kind of folding the work in on itself. You're, you're making a cinnamon roll. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like, there's another component to this. Uh, the other component is uh, I select still images, still frames from that video and present them as still image prints. And mm -hmm. Because uh, rather like in the past, for 20 years, I would make digital prints, you know, one-off images or series. Sure. And I would just be working it in the still image domain. But as I, in about 2007, I decided to really sort of jump right into time-based work. Right. And my focus was really creating motion, motion graphic uh, pieces, but still selecting the stills from there. Uh, and still doing stills that way, you know, kind of like in uh, analog to the f photographic process of, you know, you're pulling stills from the world. You're in the you snap the shutter. You're capturing a still moment mm -hmm. in this uh, dynamic, you know, multi-dimensional <laughs> motion space. Sure, so it's it's kind of like that. Um, so let me uh, share screen again, and I will get, gravitate towards. Uh, Anyway, I want to just share some still images uh, mm -hmm. that I've collected from from the video or selected. So there's this one's kind of like the uh, the flagship image, and there's various moments here from that, and uh, we can. I'm gonna have to enlarge them. So each one, you know, if you pause on it for a while, has its own particular. Uh, eat, you know, sensibility in a way, its own particular composition, its own particular narrative in and of itself, but it's part of this, you know, micro, micro narrative in a larger sense. Uh, and to talk a little bit about the, the meaning of the piece, it, it's kind of like, uh, it's sort of based on the notion of, and I, of, uh, Almost like, you know, the, the famous story of if you, uh, if say you're on your deathbed and your life flashes before your eyes, you know, your entire life plays back. It's kind of from that concept. And it's, it's, uh, and you see this motif of this, this guy here. 
Mm. And I, I think of it as he's the protagonist of the narrative. And it's kind of like a, uh, a picture of his memories, what's going on in his head. And he's in this kind of like a hallucinatory and a psychedelic environment. So, you know, it is perhaps like a, a altered state experience that he might be having vibing on, on fleeting memories. Or, uh, or, or maybe an unstuck in time like Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut. Hmm. I'm not so familiar with that, but I okay. would, if it's a reference, I, I, I would trust, knowing you, uh, Patrick, I would trust that it's right on <laughs> as a reference. It's, it's, it's a guy who basically wound up uh, random accessing parts of, a, parts of his life and in various parts of time. And that sort of uh, thing. So I, I think it works. All right, cool. Uh, so these are uh, stills from that moment so they can bring back the video. And these can, are available. I actually have these available, about 20 of them, for, on OpenSea as NFTs. So they're, you know, they're a series, uh, individual. I think, I think of them as, as collectibles in an odd, uh, perverse sense. You know, that's more of a fine art take, but, you know, they're from this uh, artifact. And the, and the entire video itself is uh, available as an NFT. Uh, mm. so that, that's there. So that's that's pretty much that's the piece in the show, and I'm I'm happy to be able to sort of unpack it. Sure. Uh, there was one other thought I wanted to mention. <clears throat> you know, I it just came to me as the the title of the piece. You know, the red shadow, and I thought about it later, and I thought, you know, it might be this almost like a subliminal memory mm -hmm. of of an allusion to Edgar Allan Poe's The Mask of the Red Death. Mm -hmm. uh, as a motif and the idea of mortality and this sort of overshadowing red motif across the, the narrative. As, as a shadow, as, as a symbol of one's own mortality, the red shadow. The red shadow, exactly. That's kind of where it came from, I think. And then uh, later, Vincent Price uh, was it starred in a film in 1964. You know, I would have been 10 years old. So, you know, I didn't think about that consciously, but I, I thought, well, maybe that, kind of came it was in my subconscious to yeah. to feel like uh the red is a motif and it has these kind of uh, uh inferences yeah well was that a hammer film uh hammer film yes yeah with well, the, the hammer horrors uh oh the, the, I, ha the, the hammer studio like with christopher lee and and all that sort of thing. You know. It could have been. I mean, right back in the day, Vincent Price was in a series of those, right? House of the yeah. Seven Gables, I think, or the Wax yeah. Museum. Yeah, exactly. Different ones like that. Yeah, those. Totally off on this, but. Does those go, do those kind of conjure uh, childhood memories of sort of being aware of these or maybe oh, after yeah. the fact? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I grew up on horror movies on Saturday afternoon. Ah. You know, with, with, with TV show hosts and things like that. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I remember that. Oh, okay, great. So uh, that was fun. Thanks. Have, have you always been in Los Angeles? Yeah, for the most part. I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, uh, but I moved to um, uh, New York for about 14 years. I was there from 95. And um, I also, um, I lived in Albuquerque for, uh, let's see, a couple of years. I moved okay. when I was in my 20s. In 1976, I moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico. That was my first long distance move. Sure. And then I spent 13 years in Hollywood. You know, I grew up near near Hollywood, but I actually moved. And that was an interesting experience. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> As I said earlier that this has two parts. Uh, this is my presentation, Text Freshes and Beginning to Southampton. And... Um, the interesting thing of this particular piece that I have in the show called uh, mm -hmm. Questions in Cell Life Number Three, it's a it's a mix between um, my study of um, the work of Vasily Kandinsky in the early '90s, um, my interaction with uh, algorithms like um, uh, algorithmic artists like Roman Brasco in the early '90s, and my um, and how I feel that feeds into other sensibilities like uh, the, the Dadaist and um, surrealist artists like uh, 
uh, like Breton and Arp in their, um, in their automatic writing and uh, automatist pieces. And then going onward to people like Namjoon Pike in his Zen for head piece where he dipped his head into uh, um, Sumi ink and dragged his head along a, a piece of paper. That's wild. <laughs> and so, you know, I have all these historical things running around in my head, kind of slamming together, which uh, I, I think is a is kind of a, a you know a, a rich little petri dish dish for <laughs> thinking. So yeah. here's a, here's here's sort of like who I call my first mentor, um, Vasily Kandinsky. Every work of art is the child of its time. Often, it's the mother of its uh, of our emotions. And um, I was a I was a computer engineer um, in the nineteen in, ni in around nineteen ninety, and um, I quit about nineteen ninety one. Um, my mother was an artist, and this is really what I wanted to do. You know, my my parents always wanted me to be in engineering or computer programming or whatnot because they thought that that was always you know the most lucrative thing and stable, which I'd say with programming probably is the most stable. And uh, out of those. And um, but they never saw that I was writing or, or making music on the on the thing, and um, that eventually took over, and uh, I left the field, and um, started up my own studio, and and studied intensively for a couple of years with uh, with very little income, as artists do. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't actually go to art school until I met Colin, uh, which I, I and uh, upon which time I had become already a very established artist, actually. Um, but I needed a degree, and also another tech specialist, De Gregory Little, um, who was an old friend of mine, said, "Come study with me." I said, "That would be fantastic." Mm -hmm. So, um, as you can see here, after I sat down and in, uh, in 1992, I had basically um, set myself down with. Kandinsky's books, Point and Line to Plane, and uh, Considering the Spiritual and Art, and really studied them cover to back for about three to four months and made uh, 24 watercolors, which uh, um, basically looked like me doing straight line Kandinsky's, but that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when you're doing studies like that, that's what happens. Sure. And so this is the cover of computer, um, I think, Computer Graphics Magazine in 1994. Hmm. And uh, this is called By the Sea, I believe. And um, this is where uh, I'm starting to do this actually um, on, on the computer with, uh, I, I think I've got a tablet here. And this is fra a Fractal Design Painter. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm using the chalks and such and, and hmm. with these. And um, you can kind of see that I'm still very heavily influenced by Kandinsky, but I'm starting to move into my own space. Um, so late mid to late 1990s, I was doing a lot in, um, um, let's see, your generative work, a little, believe it or not, a little bit of VR actually, and um, a lot of video work. And it would take, um, basically having seen Verosco's um, plotter work and then uh, coming up with my own uh, approach to it by having little rovers uh, going around with uh, Sumi pink, uh, Sumi ink um, pens, and um, making their own designs and avoiding obstacles on a on a plane. This is my piece called Zen for Bot, and you know named after uh, Zen for Head by Namjoon Pike. And so, what the black marks are are these are the these are the kind of obsessive markings uh, that the um, that the rover would make with the Sumi brush. And uh, I would move the uh, obstacles around, and it would it would keep trying to avoid or hit or or so on. And uh, I love the patterns that they made. And this is thirty by forty inches, and these would go up to go up to actually roughly um, nine by twenty one feet. Wow. Um, yeah. And these I'd have these suckers running around, and they, on the nine by twenty one foot one, I mean, I'd I'd have a couple rovers burn out, and. Oh. Um, <laughs> Just, just roach the, it just absolutely Ooh. just roach the motors on these things. Whoa. But one of the things that that's crucial to my digital work in regards to these notions of expressionism and algorithm is the idea that the black marks are the robot, the red marks are me. And I think this is, um, I think this is 
also I called, I think I called this one pattern recognition. So in other words, I, I went and I saw figures within these, you know, with, within these, within these uh, pieces and brought them out and, um, you know, um, basically showed what I thought and then pulled my subject out of them, uh, mm. out of the, as these things were going. Um, so to me, these were sort of a um, exercise in pattern recognition. Um, from this series went on into the late 2000s and then about, um, I went on to other things, came back about 2015, did a series of, uh, of pen plotter pieces of, uh, of, of, of cats and uh, basically um, playing um, back and forth a little bit with my friend, Joseph DeLapp, who was starting to do his drone, pa drone thrift paintings basically having cats swatting at swatting at drones calling predator versus predator which i thought were fun pieces in which I did. <laughs> yeah you know uh patrick i had a question about the piece we we're yeah. just looking at sure. so i guess you had the plotter first like draw out the black lines yes. and then you overlaid your uh, calligraphy or the markings yep. in response to that in red yep so how did the machine uh, know what to draw? I mean, it's very sort of loose and expressive and interesting, but did you give it an algorithm of some sort to get it started or did you just let it do whatever it's going to do? I mean, how did you guide well, it initially? Well, what, I, what I did is that I, I set up what they call initial conditions and, uh, for an, uh, an algorithm. And so what, what this little, what this little three wheeled Rover had, it, it basically had, infrared um, avoidance um, sensors on it. And it would be running around and it would come up within three inches of a wall and then it'd turn like, um, I, I had a random number between 20 and 30 degrees. And then it would um, back up a little bit and then it would try another way. And then, then it'd go and hit another, another boundary, another boundary, another boundary. And so it'd be going and doing this um, you know, re repeated set of motions. Mm. Um, and uh, and working around the boundaries, and sometimes I would also change and change the uh, the obstacles um, in in the space so that it create different patterns. Ah, oh, interesting. And so once again, this idea of the cybernetic, you know, the idea yeah. of you know, the, the human being working with you know working in tandem with the machine. And um, so most of my work is actually cybernetic. Yeah. And so what's what's happening here is that uh, or um, I'll drop a word out here that few people hear that um, Gregory Little and I, I like to drop a little bit once in a while, or what they call synoetic, which we think that the system is a creates an output which is greater than the sum of its parts, mm -hmm. rather than you know. So anyway, um, but the idea here yeah. is, is is the fact that this has an algorithm; it has it reacts dynamically to the environment. And, and so it basically just responds to what I've given it. And then, and then I'd let it run, do its thing, mess with it, you know, play with it a little bit, um, have the conversation. And then after that, I would go in and I would, I would make the marks. Oh, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So, um, so as I said, in between, there's some pieces that I don't have in here, which I really don't fit, think fit the text brush just, uh, idea so much, but they were more um, algorith algoristic pieces. Um, and that were at actually at DAM gallery and um, uh, for artifacts and uh, rise of the machines at uh, Barristers Gallery in New Orleans. And, um, and also, um, I think, um, sensible objects at, uh, um, at the yard in New York in 2015, mm. that had these cats. So fast forward 2020, um, by 2018, I had started doing these really obsessive um, calligraphy pieces while I was in Abu Dhabi. Um, basically in the morning um, after breakfast, I would sit down and, and my second language is Japanese actually. And mm. uh, so I'd start doing these, these sumi works and you can sort of see, you know, these, these were what they call acemic, in other words, without meaning. So what happens is that um, I'd be doing these calligraphy works based on my understanding of Japanese calligraphy. 
Um, and then once again, referring back to my interest in, in automatism and um, basically letting my mind go. And I'd make about three, 4,000 of these things. Wow. Um, talk about what I do with these things in, in, in the future. Um, but so um, about this time, Colin gives me a call and he says, uh, hey, um, I've got this idea and I'd like you to be part of it. Uh, I want to do this thing called text expressionism and um, let's have a meeting on September 1st. And that would have uh, me, Colin, Helen Harrison, Oz Van Rosen, Steve Miller. And um, we, we um, kind of came up with some of those uh, things that you uh, mentioned in the beginning. Hmm. And um, so, and, um, you know, for me, a lot of people can, you know, um, consider me either a writer or someone who's involved in critical art, but my, my roots are in expressionism. So I thought, you know, this was, this, this was fine. And, um, you know, and uh, it was also another great collaborative space from um, my, my dear partner, Nagina Etasabian and I to work in and, and, um, mm -hmm. and uh, be part of together. So, um, and, and as you'll, as you'll see, keep and keeping on. Um, so um, let's see here, uh, Davo uh, Bradley, um, ba uh, basically had been putting together, um, uh, let's see here, text expressionist um, collaboratives. And uh, the first one I think had uh, Roz Diamond and uh, Nagina Tasabian and uh, I think Davo and um, I forget who else. But um, the second one had Colin and I, and this really kind of brought what I've been doing in text expressionism, text expressionism together. Um, so as I said, I'd been doing these calligraphy series, and this was actually a piece for um, that I used for a poster that was with a um, AI group that uh, Ann Spalder and Carl Gannis and I, and also uh, another of other art artists. Um, use called Playform, and this is um, this is a piece from that called Dream Within a Dream. But mm. I'd been doing a series of these um, for about two or three years, and I would feed them into um, the Playform engine and uh, let them just go and go and go and go. And I would come up with some really interesting uh, shapes like this. And so this is something that I called personal taxonomy. And what I was wondering about was, if I feed enough of these things together and contrast them against each, each other, because what, what general um, adversarial networks do is that they discriminate one set of images against another. And I was wondering if I take enough images and basically gang them up against each other enough, whether I'd find what's in common and whether that would basically show kind of like the outlines of the marks that I would be doing um, obsessively through almost every piece of work that I'd done out of those three, 4,000 pieces. And then maybe creating like an inner taxonomy of, of my own um, inner mark making. In other words, hmm. hey, this, is, this is the probability of where you're gonna put your mark, <laughs> you know, and um, therefore kind of maybe outsmarting myself. And here's a, um, Here's an example of um, what this looks like animated. Hmm, okay. Over the epochs. Nice. So this is really some interesting stuff, and it, it really makes me, you know, think think is that is is this maybe this mapping of what's what the patterns are in my mind over time? Either one of two things. I'm either finding something really profound. Or I'm chasing my tail in the most spectacular way possible, and that can be. I think that's got to be interesting to somebody, right? <laughs> oh yes. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, oh wow, that's absolutely meaningless, but wow, that's really interesting to see you do that. <laughs> so well, that's, that's cool. Yeah, I, I, I like these animated ones. Yeah, I do. I mean, too. they're all very interesting, but th these in particular jump out at me. I mean, yeah, uh, being you know into motion graphics, I like that. Absolutely. And uh, 
and I, they could have music too, or, you know, a soundtrack mm -hmm. or maybe generate music, you know, well, if, be an audio. Remember, in, in remember, remember in the, in the previous one, you know, with the spinning one. Oh yeah. This is, this is kind of what I'm pointing to. And so I'm, I'm thinking about this here, here, here as well. That's, yeah, you know what? It's, I'm also taken by that both you and Colin may be independent of it's. I guess it sounds like independent of each other. We're both into this similar calligraphy approach on some of your work. You guys have a very much uh, a, in alignment. Yeah, well, I mean that's not surprising, being that we came from the same graduate school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean we both studied together at Bowling Green State University with Greg Little. You know, who's another yeah. tech expressionist. So. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and there, so that was kind of a, like a, a context where the, your calligraphic impulse was kind of fostered. Um, I back don't know. then, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I was doing, I was doing the robotic work back then and um, you know, Colin was doing his vector work, you know, so I, I, I could say that, that there's some convergence back there, you know um, you know, that they they, we were most definitely in, in conversation. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 definitely a possibility. Yeah. So we well, could have cool. each other. Yeah. So um, oh here here we go. And uh the spinning piece. And so as I said, the other things that I was doing is that I was doing um layering from uh, what they call the uh sketch of still life or you know, do the sketch um uh the sketch elements in within play form and which and then I'd put up style transfer on it and then it creates something like a baroque style or a you know a monet style or what whatnot i take four or five of these mm -hmm. lay these in and then you know as, as we saw before. so that's how that yeah so that's kind of a still that's kind of a still version of um nice so that's that's really kind of my process on that um, so let's see. So that's kind of, that's there, there you have it. That's kind of the story behind, you know, my processes and such, you know, up to, okay. um, text expression is still life number three. So what's, um, uh, what's next from text expression, text expressionism, um, digital and beyond. Uh, well, on one hand, I'm, curating the uh, International Digital Media Association show, Weird Media, which is featuring several text expressionist artists. But within text, uh, text expressionism itself, um, possibly uh, there was some discussion with uh, Dava Bradley about a third collaboration piece. And uh, my dear wife, partner, and uh, collaborator in all things, uh, Nagina Tasabian, and I uh, volunteered to um, do a um, to do a um, a collaboration, and there we go. And that's uh, Nagin, who is the uh, originator of Text Expressionism IR. And this is a show we did in Cyprus called Through the Mesh at Nimi.org. Now it's over winter break. And let's see here. So the, the project, let's see here, hang on just a second. So the project we call Mare City, Mare being uh, one of the words for love, has to do with the fact that many times Nagin and I have been um, geographically separated for geopolitical reasons. On one hand is that at the moment we're waiting for her visa, and um, for obvious reasons, myself as an American have had trouble um, going to Iran. Um, so, and so our, we have this collaboration that we've done called uh, Googled Earth. And uh, here we see one of the installation pieces with um, actually a carpet in the middle, which is something that, uh, came out of this about two years prior, but uh, we uh, we made it just recently. And this is going to be part of the collaboration three. So this is uh, something called Googled Earth. Basically, um, 
you can see the two pieces at the sides. Those are the two pieces that are at the Southampton Arts Center. Um, hmm. And um, this is all basically a piece about our perceptions through uh, looking through media and using Google VR, um, visiting each other's countries and seeing what we've, we've looked at. I mean, I do uh, plotter drawings and video, um, basically looking at um, areas from my, my childhood and Nagin's life. And uh, she did, of course, the huge tapestries at the Southampton um, Arts Center, which um, are, are here. Um, so as I said, we, this, this is an example of us here, you know, going through New York and we're just kind of uh, maybe going out, going up the uh, uh, near West side and just seeing, um, you know, just talking about, you know, our, our experiences, you know, sh my sharing um, my time in, in New York with her. And um, okay, cool. There we go, which is kind of fun. And well, this is nice. actually, yeah. that, that was the first um, with uh, Brandon Gellis at, uh, with um, Critical Abstraction. And these are the, pe these are actually the pieces that um, here that are in the um, SAC show. They were first shown at um, University of Wyoming. Hmm. So to expressionism collab number three, the one thing that uh, we thought that we'd do is that you saw the uh, carpet in the middle and the idea, this idea of Mirror City um, has to do with basically making kind of a situationist map of all the uh, cities that were, have been important to us like Limassol, Cyprus and Tehran and Baku where we met and where we lived in Abu Dhabi and Chicago and, and all these places. And so, um, we worked together on coloring motifs and uh, merging the uh, maps together. And basically, this is where we're at with this. We're planning on putting this out as a uh, also as an 80 by 60 um, jacquard weaving. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is we've got one of two done. And this is what we're um, this is our first product for the text freshness uh, collaboration number three. OK, great. Yeah. So That's great. I like that. It's, it must yeah, be very, uh, you know, intense seeing it live when you have it as a jet card later. Exactly. Yeah, they're, they're really, really intense. So what's interesting is up on up on the left, you've got Chicago and then mm. up in the middle here, you've got um, uh, you've got some Abu Dhabi and uh, where we were married was down on the uh, down on the bottom here, Fatia, Turkey. And you've got some Tehran in the middle, and yeah, it's a it's an interesting piece. Yeah, interesting. It's kind of uh, you know mind map melded into mapped over a geographical exactly. uh, cartography. Exactly. Kind of a blend. Interesting. Cool. Great. Well, thanks so much for uh, walking okay. us through that. Sure. It's very uh, nice in depth look in your, at your process and. Mm -hmm. uh, some of your uh, backstory as a you know conceptualist and as an artist yes yeah. so uh, okay so um, I will then enter into uh, this section here so talking about uh, sort of my past work and uh, the concept behind uh, my work and uh, some of the process I, I thought I would read my uh, statement a short statement uh, that has two parts here uh, so, and, and it kind of addresses my video work initially. Uh, my recent videos are informed and influenced by electronic music and abstract jazz-based forms, as well as R. Buckminster Fuller's synergetics and classical sacred geometry. I also owe a conceptual debt to the moving painting work of Bill Viola, as well as the pioneering practitioners of visual music. For example, Jordan Belson, Oscar Fissinger, Norman McLaren and John and James Whitney Sr. I think of my videos as existing in the lexicon nexus between experimental film and visual music. At the heart of my motion graphics practice is, a, is the core sensibility of being a painter. I think you can see that in the dynamic layering of graphical textures to be found in the work. 
the look and sensibility of my work derive from an ongoing commitment to practice visual perception filtered or sensed through a reference to polyhedral structure. The real-time apprehension of the topological coordinates of interconnected densities in the field of view facilitates an expressive rendering of the natural energetic resonance present in even, in the, most, in even the most prosaic of scenes. My goal is to provide visual artifacts such that a viewer, end user, or participant may augment the conceptions and perceptions they bring with them. So that last sentence kind of almost refers to future work because I, I have dabbled in VR and I have dabbled in zone, uh, dome projection. Mm -hmm. So it's this uh, immersive uh, aspect uh, and, uh, and the VR could actually be ported into a AR. I've done a little bit of AR work as mm -hmm. well. So um, that's exciting to me, these modern forms that are, have emerged from more recent uh, facile technologies that have been around for a long time, but now they have the compute power behind them to really make them uh, really accessible to a larger user base. Uh, so that's why I use the, the term viewer, end user, or participant, mm -hmm. and the, the uh, implied interactivity of a maybe a VR environment if you have it designed with agency mm -hmm. in mind. So with, with that, uh, so this is one of my earliest uh, images from 1987. You know, I started in digital art working, making images with comu computers in 1983, but moved gradually across that four year period to 87. And I feel that's when things really coalesced and I had a, a certain level of facility with this new uh, tool set for making images. So then uh, jumping ahead to uh, 1994, by then, you know, as other uh, software tool sets became available to me, uh, I would gravitate towards them, you know, from that 2D vector work. Uh, I got into the Cubicomp, which was a 3D modeling and animation uh, program that ran on the PC desktop. And then later on in the early 90s, about 93, I got access to the soft image uh, uh, program. Uh, which and then at uh, that time ran on silicone graphics uh, platform and later it was ported to the, the PCs. And I found that rather than making objects with a 3D modeler, I kind of gravitated towards using the 3D modeling to articulate the space and intervene with photographic data, if you will, basically inserting this these this uh, graphing of space using 3D models and inserting it into the photographic space. Mm -hmm. And so I arrived at images like this and uh, wanted to kind of articulate or make visible the sort of the energetic domain in which humans are operating uh, independent of themselves or also uh, their inter intervention or interaction with the energetic domain by virtue of their own uh, psychological or emotional or uh, cerebral processes and interaction with each other. So it's, it's kind of a snapshot of the invisible in a way. And, and this one's called frame uh, 1044, an allusion to time-based work, but it was purely assembled as a still image at the time. And then later, uh, a couple of years later, uh, and some of you, many of you have seen this image before. Uh, this is called the Lace Maker from 1996, which I named after uh, Vermeer's painting from uh, 1665. And then uh, 2001, uh, working, continuing on with that concept using kind of a space frame and architectonic rendering of energetic fields. Uh, mm -hmm. I made this image, which is a portrait of my older brother, Kind of energetic mm. uh, portrait uh, in in the, what I would call the void matrix, which comes from my readings of uh, the Tao of Physics by Fritzhoff Kopra. I read mm -hmm. the, that book in the late seventies, but it really stuck with me when I was a first uh, undergrad uh, art student. As a, that's a great conceptual basis to explore pictorially this the void plenum as as it was described in his book. 
uh, this domain of reality, which is at once completely empty, at the same time, paradoxically, brimming over with uh, potentialities of being or materiality. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's that both of those at the same time. So, you know, the notion that we emerge from that, you know, living beings, you know, where do we come from? Where are we going? We emerge from this uh, underlying domain of the void plenum or the void matrix. So that really drove a lot of my, the look of my imagery, a snapshot of uh, everyday scenes happening within the void matrix. Uh, this is a portrait of my other brother, uh, Eric. And this one has called, some of these I've shown before, uh, what's so different about today's inner child. Mm. And this one's from 2002. And this was actually, the photograph was taken at the St. Regis Hotel in New York, Salvador Dali's uh, famous haunt uh, when he used to come to New York, I guess the late sixties and during the seventies. Um, so it was sort of like in, in one of the side lobbies there, they have some pictures in, in a hallway. So that there's that sort of underlying for me, you know, I don't, when I look at this image, oh yeah, you know, the St. Regis Hotel. So there's that Dalinian surrealist connection as well, as well as this void matrix metaphor. So later, oh, and here's another image, uh, more recently in 2006. So this is kind of leading, as I was saying before, you know, for about 20 years, my focus was gener composing still images that I would, could be viewed on the screen or I would output as digital prints, uh, initially with the Iris inkjet printer, and then later with the, uh, with other tools, uh, the Epson print printers, the, the wide format print printers uh, rolled out and they solved the problem of uh, archival inks that wouldn't fade. So I would I did a lot of printmaking in that way. Uh, so then when I started getting into time-based work, uh, as I was also saying before, a, another set of imagery emerged, imagery that was purely abstract, uh, that had no figuration, and it, it became the comp compositions were comprised of this of this imagery, but still informed by polyhedra. You can see it in this image, which is I, I titled this piece "Mantric Fullerene," uh, and we have the famous Buckminster Fullerene that many of you know, which is I think it's called in polyhedra speak uh, truncated icosahedron. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was a protagonist in one of my visual music pieces. Uh, but I thought just as a still image in and of itself, it was kind of fun to look at. And here's an, an example of a, a still that uh, was based on a previous uh, digital image. It was a 3D model of a human skull and a, and a deer, two 3D models interposed. But then it was kind of warped out in real time. We talked earlier about uh, VJ software and performances mm -hmm. and using it in the studio or, or in a live event. So this is taking a, an earlier piece of mine, you know, bringing it in, projecting it, and then tweaking it in real time. And it, in a sense, morphs into an animated piece because the software can do that. It can distort it over time, as well as you might juxtapose it, like in the background, you'll see this kind of circular, that's another layer of video that's moving in its own right. So you can, you have these sort of like, uh, well, this is a snapshot from a dynamic motion-based composition. Uh, I have a question. In a lot of these, are you doing um, um, spherical translations? Not directly, but okay. the, 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 the filter, the processing yeah. that I overlay on the video has a spherical mapping oh. it, mm -hmm. in it. So yeah. So mm -hmm. it, it, it does generate this biomorphic sort of spheroid type of uh, imagery or mm -hmm. morphologies that emerge. Yeah, so there's a, and, and that fits right in with my interest in Buckminster Fuller and sphere, sphericity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. And to, to show a, f a few more here, uh, here's another one. This is a still from a piece called Terabyte Psychedelics. Uh, and 
you know, this might just, this is like one frame in 30 frames per second. But when I, I can, you know, just tap through the timeline and then certain images jump out at me and this was one. I mean, this looks like, I mean, this is a classic <laughs> expressionist image. You know, it has the in a sort of a 21st century expressionism, uh, but, you know, born, born of a digital or cybernetic process mm -hmm. uh, and then conveyed the substrate is video, really. And, and then that can be translated uh, into, a, into a physical print. And then here's another, in the next image, uh, harks back to now brings back the figuration circling back mm -hmm. and, uh, of my earliest work it's, it's a self portrait here uh, using an Android phone and then uh, superimposed in it or composited in is this purely uh, it's a kind of a processed digital object you know it's a model that is really a 3d computer model uh, that was sort of you know morphed out here's that biomorphic distortion again and then placed in this uh photograph that was taken by a phone you know i was i was looking shooting into a mirror so i i had this photograph of me taking a a shot with my phone into a mirror and then i just superimposed this uh digital object in it as if you know, the implication is i'm photographing this object you know which could be almost like a uh a photograph of an AR experience, you know, that uh, third parties are, are viewing. And here's, here's uh, an example of that kind of digital object on its own, which was 3D, once again, a 3D model morphed uh, with the video software, with the VJ software. This has been a digital handshake, uh, a conversation with myself and Patrick Lichty. It's been a great pleasure to spend this time uh, talking together, and it's been exciting to see all the different ideas and concepts that emerge in the conversation and the backstory on the work. And it's, we're, I'm excited to have this uh, conversation archived so an audience can view it later and uh, maybe get a little bit uh, deeper understanding of where we're coming from and where we fit into this text expressionist movement and uh, the digital art timeline as we've participated in over the decades, bringing, bringing us to this moment. Of course, I, I totally agree, is that uh, one of the things that um, I think is really interesting that after, oh, at, during and after every time I reflect on the work and have conversations about the work, that new things reveal themselves. And the thing that I think is really interesting is that after this time, it makes, um, you know, it's made so much sense that, you know, from my beginnings through, um, you know, throughout my entire career, I say that I have about basically one of three, one of three threads that are usually going on at one time. One is this expressionist generativity sort of, sort of process that's brought, brought me to expressionism. I think that, um, tropes like text expressionism as being the fourth uh, manifestation of expressionism since the Blau writer and the and and de Bruca. um you know makes sense in this day and age for what uh, what it is and I think also it um, it's interesting to see where um, our sensibilities go into it and where it, it it makes total sense for you know our our being part of it and I'm, I'm yeah. glad that we had that conversation Yes, absolutely. All right, cool. Well, thanks so much, Patrick, okay. for uh, you know sharing this time with me and, and chatting with me on this. It's been great. It's been excellent. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks a lot.